Edisman, Peter. Can you swear to tell the truth? And no. <laughs> I do not. I will not. Um, there, there was, uh, we, were, we, were, we were talking uh, with, with Jeremy about some things he didn't really want to get into, which is blame uh, in this story. And I mean, I, after seeing it last night, I, I went straight and uh, I, I remember reading about it. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm Canadian, but I, was, I remember reading it in the, in the LA Weekly when I was here before the movie. I think it was even a project. Um, but, you know, the, the LA, the, the, the Times uh, had 17 people assigned to debunking this, crushing this guy. Mm -hmm. And that's not even counting the Washington Post and the New York Times. Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems beyond even, even just sort of normal newspaper politics. Well, look, I, you know, blame is a funny word because it, um, it, it, suggests, <clears throat> it suggests a lot of things. I would just talk about responsibility and, and, and the job and the work. And I think that devoting <laughs> 17 reporters, including your Washington bureau chief, who they called in, you know, to not, not, not do what their job would have been. I mean, if I were the editor, you know, if I were a reporter, I'd say, okay, well, here's a story, slightly imperfect, little details he got wrong, you know, in general, true, in general, like, yeah, I understand how drugs ended up in L.A. that way. It's not that complicated. You have Federal Express taking weapons in one direction and coming back empty, and the planes needed, they, the guys needed to fill up the planes coming back, and they were doing a job for us, and, you know, how it lands, that, that all makes perfect sense to me. That's not complicated. But how about taking that story and moving it forward? How about taking that story and just well, you know, doing what Gary did and then you know, carrying the story? As a career newspaper writer, I can tell you that that's standard. If somebody beats you on a story, you take that story and, and, and look for ways to, look for avenues to, to improve it. Correct. You know, that's, and, your, that's the job. And if you find things wrong, you say, here's, what, you know, yeah. here's, here's the real story. It's a, it's a, look, news is what we call the first draft of history, correct? So it's a relay race. Right? You carry a story forward, you take it to here, then a report picks it up and moves it forward. That's what the job is. In this story, this became about, um, it became about a lot of things. I mean, Gary was an outsider by choice. You know, partly out of narcissism, partly out of logistics because he was on the other side of the country, partly because he was, at, he was a fish out of water, right? He, Kentucky, Cleveland, San Jose. So suddenly he finds himself in the Washington arena. Um, and... Uh, he, he didn't have the tools. He was building a house with a hammer and a screwdriver, but he didn't have all the other stuff that he needed. And, uh, and they didn't like it. You know, I've written, you know, when I was working for the New York Times Magazine, I wrote very big controversial stories that tread in other people's territory, and they went after me in the exact same way. It wasn't about the story, it wasn't about the information, it wasn't about how can we work together and pool sources, which happens. It was about how can we fuck this guy up so he doesn't, hurt us in the eyes of our editors and our colleagues uh, and make me feel smaller. The well, writing that sucks. Yeah, it sucks. It's part, of, it's part of the job. Look, every job is politics to it, especially the movie business. Um, you know, I had the exact same thing. I had an editor at the New York Times Magazine who was super ambitious and, you know, whenever we got into something that was extremely controversial, she backed off. You know, she, instead of leaning in, she ran. And she, you know, like Webb, left me exposed and isolated and betrayed. And reporters go through that a lot. Is that why you felt so emotionally, I'm assuming, felt so emotionally connected to this film? Fuck yeah. I mean, you know, I was, when I wrote this movie, I was, I was still at the tail end of, of, of career in journalism, this kind of journalism. Yeah, I mean, you know, I felt kinship to Gary Webb. I went through a lot of what he went through, including the personal dissolution and the depression and confusion and, and aloneness. And I understand everything he did from fighting to the breakup of his marriage to killing himself. Can I ask you what you were writing about that you felt so betrayed? Uh, it was a cover story about sex trafficking and sex slavery in the New York Times Magazine. And it was the first story that exposed that it was happening uh, to a massive degree in this country. And, you know, Eastern European and Latina girls being brought up through Mexico into the United States you know, through that border, and I was attacked. And it's funny because today we look back, we're like, "Well, that's fucking obvious," you know. But in two thousand and four, two thousand and five, when the story came out, which is right when Gary killed himself, uh, I was attacked by every major um, media outlet for. I mean, I w it was Kafka esque. I was told I simply had made it up. I was accused, including by people inside the New York Times of never having gone to Mexico to report that I spent over a year there reporting that story. It was, it was like suddenly north became south and east became west and 
and uh, the compass started spinning and I completely understood exactly what you went through from you know editors who backed you because they thought they saw you know they saw this story as an elevator up just as Jerry Seppos and Don Garcia did the, at the Merck for with this story with Gary elevator up a little controversy a little interference a little turbulence suddenly the interest became about well who owns us the paper who pays our salaries will I be able to graduate to the New York Times and the LA Times and the Washington Post after this story because we're throwing egg in their faces then suddenly it doesn't become about, is the story true? It becomes about, should we tell it? And once you ask that question as a journalist, you're fucked. It's over. So, uh, Sorry, yeah. I loved how you wrote this because I, I, I knew exactly where you were coming from. I know what it's like to be attacked from people. And then in the end, you're the last one left standing and you're right. It's you're like not that. standing, you're fucking upside down with your head in the... In the Right, yeah. So why not write your story? Your story wasn't fluffy or puffy or anything like that. And you probably could have um, ma made your story instead of, of this story. Or is that well to, co to come? No, I mean, I became a writer of other movies, and now I'm a director, and I'm telling other stories. I feel like that experience informs a lot of what I do. That I, I write a lot of movies. I'm about to direct a movie about whistleblowers and truth tellers. And uh, I'm motivated by it. My story was too personally ugly. I have no, um, you know, I didn't, I was, and I ended up being vindicated, but personally ruined for a time. I don't want to revisit that. I would think you'd be very, very curious as to how this, this movie is received by the film critics and others at, at the Washington you know, Post, New York Times. I York expect Times. a few things. I expect editors will be very, will, I think, <laughs> I think editors will have a. I think editors might have a hard time with this movie because it reminds them a of how hard their job is and b of their decision trees when it comes to what to print and why. And I think it's going to force them to, you know, feel or confront discomfort. Let's say I think reporters should be um, reporters and reviewers should be um, motivated by it. What about the people that are depicted? As I understand it, every, everybody uh, in San Jose paper got promoted afterwards that, that was involved. Well, I don't actually know the, I don't actually know the information I don't know, but you know, from the corporate, from the corporate side of that paper and that organization, I guess that they'd ultimately defended, you know, the Alamo at the expense of one man. So it wouldn't surprise me if they were. I don't, I don't know that they were. Talk about the and not to give away any of the ending, uh, when the African-American community is coming out and supporting him because they knew all along what was going on. That's a powerful statement right there. Yeah. I don't think they knew, I don't think they knew where the dope came from, nor did they, they care, nor do, does anybody care now. I mean, I think people, you know, buy and ingest drugs and don't really ask, you know, what the price is paid by the people who, you know, along the, the railroad, you know, that gets the drugs to its, their end users. Um, so, but specifically, you know, what the, what the, well, you know, it's complicated. I mean, there's a lot of interest, for instance, Ricky Ross, you know, that Michael K. Williams played in the movie. Um, you know, as a personality, as a kind of Al Sharpton community figure, the guy's a fucking degenerate monster. He's got him, uh, Ricky, uh, I, what, is, what is his nickname? Freeway Ricky. Freeway Ricky. Yeah. You know, he's a monster. I mean, he put crack on the streets in, in the mouths of these children and killed them. I mean, he's, you know, he was building, um, I love the self mythology that the guys created. You know, he's building community centers, he's getting money back to the community. That's just it's like it's like Hitler saying, you know, I'll you know, build a few synagogues. I mean it's just it's just it's <laughs> utter nonsense. I I think that um, his elevation is deeply concerning to me. Because to me he's dirt. And uh, and he's the he's the cause. He's he's not any kind of hero. And uh, you know, Gary um, and other reporters, by the way, Gary's not alone. There are other reporters who are on this and carried it forward. And, um, you know, in the face of enormous, enormous turbulence, if I'm the African, I'm African American community, I ask, you know, I mean, I spent a year in Watts on a story about the Great Street Crips and the Donnie Hunter Bloods and the police unit that polices them. You know, what happened? What happened to this community? You know, that's the question I'd be asking. What happened and why? So I hope I hope their reaction to this movie is um, appropriately strong. Talk so about we, putting this cast together. Very very excellent cast. Well, I was making another movie at the time. I mean, I wrote it, 
I produced it, I got it going, and then I went off and wrote and directed Parkland. So Michael, you know, Michael and Naomi and Scott put together just, I mean, it's an all-star team. Um, you know, starting with Jeremy, who's one of the great actors of our time. Um, I couldn't be happier. I mean, who could be, who could be unhappy with this cast? Right? Now, this is, this is uh, based on a book? You know, I, I took, there was a book called Kill the Messenger that Nick Scarra is very good. It's kind of a, an over, it's an umbrella story. It's an umbrella book. You know, it doesn't, it's not a deep dive into anything. And, uh, you know, my relationships um, and my sources, the intelligence community, the journalists are excellent. So what I actually did was I put on my reporter hat first and I re-reported the entire story from the beginning. And really, actually, the movie actually moves the story past where Gary had it before the end. Um, at, so, what, at what point is it moved forward? It's A lot of it is in the local moments and, and what things mean. The thing about Gary is he had a forest and trees issue because he didn't understand the world he was, he was moving through. He didn't understand the intelligence community, he didn't understand Washington. Um, didn't understand how these relationships um, intersect and how they conflict, and he didn't completely understand the architecture of the Contras, which was more, it's, you know, these things, you know, rebel units and insurgencies are never like, you know, black and white, you know, or red and blue. Um, the Contras were divided and the Contras split, and some, some continued to take the cocaine money and use the, it was sort of half and half, north and south. Some continued, and the other half actually aligned themselves officially with Congress and the CIA and were publicly funded. So the beginning was all dope, and then they split. And so what other reporters said, and the Washington Post quite cleverly, was, well, Gary got that wrong. Well, he didn't get it wrong, he was thinking it completely right. So in order to understand you know, how the dope money continued, you'd have to understand the split. And then that gets complex. And, uh, but Gary missed that. Not because he ignored it, he just didn't get it yet. He would have gotten it if he kept going. He should have known you. Should have called you on the phone and you would have helped him with the story. I don't know. I might have, you know, I might have stolen it. <laughs> this morning. I don't know. What else? What do you hope the audience gets out of seeing this movie? What's important to you? Well, the relevance of what journalism is. You know, uh, look. You know, we just had another reporter get his head locked off last week. And, uh, you know, and I knew Danny Pearl in Kosovo. I met him in Kosovo. And, I, you know, I was in Pakistan, Afghanistan when that went down. You know, people take the source of this information for granted. Um, and I think, you know, what I hope audiences get is this kind of investigative journalism, this long lead, multi-month uh, stuff is really a thing of the past. You know, um, the kind of journalism I did for the Times Magazine just simply doesn't exist anymore. Um, I would spend 60 or 100 grand on a story, you know, just flying around in hotels, and nobody has that money anymore. So this, this, these kind of stories are done, except for, you know, the New York or the Atlantic occasionally, you know, a handful of outlets. But newspapers don't do this stuff anymore. So what, what we get in, in, you know, the mainstream media, as they call it now, which I'm a, which I'm a part of, is, is sort of ordained or dictated? I mean, the... Uh, there's a suggestion when you say, if you use the word blame, then that connotes something that we don't, don't want to get into. But when the character that I assume is based on uh, Katz, the reporter of the, at the LA Times, uh, says, I can't talk about this. this, there's more here than you know, or stuff. I mean, it's sort of an ominous thing he's saying, and it sounds like the CIA is involved no, somewhere. The movie doesn't say that. No, I know say that. Saying, but it wasn't true. I mean, here's the, the, the CIA... They're great at two things. They're great at fucking things up, and they're great at covering it up. And what the CIA knew is they understood the competition and ego and narcissism among other reporters better than anybody. So they knew that setting... I mean, Walter Pincus, to me, is the big bad guy in this movie. And, they, and Pincus had a very strong quid pro quo relationship with the, with the CIA, just as, the, you know, just as I had relationships with you know, government agencies. I won't say I protected them, but I certainly had relationships with them and, and worked with them, as Pincus did with the agency. And, um, and they knew they could rely on, you know, they just give one little nudge, and they knew they could rely on reporters to go after Webb because, not because he was wrong, but because they didn't do the story. And they exploited that. And then they just sat back and watched what happened. You know, they didn't talk to the, they, they didn't need to talk to these editors and reporters. Um, you know, Katz and Ralph Framolino and, 
you know, the other guys in that L.A. Times squad, and it was a kind of weird kind of hit squad that was put together. Um, I blame's a funny word. I mean, they were responsible. First of all, they were told to do what they did, and so they were just following orders by their editors. Um, but again, like, why not be constructive and move the story forward? Why focus on Gary? Why, you know, why? I mean, the L.A. Times was badly embarrassed because this was a story done in their backyard. You know, and they even had Ricky Ross. They had the bad guy. You know, they'd written about him. They just never thought to ask where he got his supply. But in the absence, oh. as you say, of, of uh, long-term investigative journalism, what do we got? Today, yeah. data and information. We don't have understanding. You know, we, we, have, we have daily updates on data. We, don't, we understand the what, we don't understand the why. Okay, so before they take... Oh. I was going to say, with your background, yeah. could you just talk about... There's a difference between news reporting and writing a film script. Did you have to make any sort of decisions about just for dramatic, i got to do this? And how does that work against your sort of, your sort of sense of... It's a really good question. Um, my instincts are to be factually accurate, but the problem is that life and history is not narrative. Narrative is, involves architecture, involves time limits to two-hour movie or 400-page book. And so I can say this. I mean, I can talk about... This actually is a subject matter that interests me a lot because having come from one world and now in the other world, and I made a movie last year called Parkland that I wrote and directed, and about to make another movie that I wrote and directed, also a true story. I have made... You know, the, 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 the compromises... I've made have been more about architectural compression and time because like I said you know stories are in life and life are in stories in this movie there are compressions of time and conflations of time and maybe conflations of event that are necessarily merely um, necessary just to tell the story but what I can tell you is even when something is fudged in that way or manipulated in that massage in that way it's always spiritually true there's nothing in this movie that's not true May not um, literally true, but spiritually true, it's all correct. Before he takes you away, you did this um, expose on sex trafficking and slavery, and they they really ran you through the mud. Um, why? How were you able to resurrect yourself and Gary was not? You know, Gary was a depressive, I'm not. You know, Gary smoked pot, I don't. Um, you know, and uh, I think Gary lost his family, and I didn't. I actually had a child during my experience. Um, Gary was 10 years older than me. Had I had all this happened to me now, I don't know what I'd do. I had, I had, uh, I had moments of enormous you know, self-destruction and doubt during that period. I was just younger, and I was more, I was at, a, the diff I was at another, at the opposite end of my career. Um, uh, and also just the circumstances were different. I had different support structures. Um, um, you know, Gary's personal life is different from mine. Um, but I can tell you that was the hardest year of my life. And I barely came out alive, to be honest with you. I changed my career. You know, it was the beginning of my transition into writing and for film and TV, and now I'm directing. And I looked at that experience, and I was like, well, I asked myself, why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through it? And, uh, and I couldn't come up with a good answer. So I eventually left. I love you because you're so honest. You just you just tell it, man. Thanks. You are just awesome. <laughs> I wish I had been reading the Times when you were coming out. I mean, I remember when the story broke. I was doing talk radio uh, for KLOS here, and um, I just I you know we had covered the downing of Eugene Hasafis's plane yeah. in yeah. in Nicaragua prior to that, ten years before. Yeah. 